Orc society has always been organised in the simplest and most brutal way. Might makes right, the strong rule the weak, etc, etc. This applies all the way through the Greenskins and their sub-races, but at the top of each tribe there is always a single individual who rules over all. These orcs have made their way to the top through a mixture of cunning and brutality, fighting their way to the summit and shutting up anyone who dares say otherwise. They get the best kit by right, they tower over their underlings as the largest of their kind, and they are vicious opponents on the battlefield for even a canny general. Though they are known by many names across the clans and the subcultures, they are known collectively as war bosses. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. What exactly makes an orc war boss in a biological sense is another unknown on top of the many unknowns regarding the greenskins. Whilst I doubt any scientists have been able to collect orc spore samples to scan them, it would not surprise me if the development of these organisms into orcs, Gretchen, or other fungi is entirely random chance, or may be influenced by the orc just out consciousness and somehow by circumstance. However these things happen, each spore will develop into one of the greenskin subraces and those that end up as orcs will diversify further. Some will somehow have the requisite skills or talents to become an odd boy, one of the specialist casts of orcdom we've discussed in a previous log. The remainder will usually develop into one of the hordes that make up much of orc society known as boys, but some will be larger, stronger and occasionally smarter than their peers. These orcs will, following the aforementioned mantra of might making right, lord it over the other boys. The largest ones are known as knobs and they demand respect and status with an iron fist if required. However, Every now and then, an even larger orc will emerge from the ranks, able to not just boss around a few boys, but the entire tribe or warband they are in. After battering down any who question their authority, these largest of orcs will become war boss, the overall leader of their tribe in matters of war and most everything else, though there's not often much that can't be delegated to an odd boy or resolved with a punch up. Depending on their previous role or affiliation, a war boss may also be known by another title, mech boss if they're a mech boy, speed boss for speed freaks, and so on. These are arguably less common, at least outside of more specialist warbands, since most normal war bosses, and I use that term loosely, would likely be larger than a specialist counterpart. However, no orc ruler should ever be underestimated by their opponents on or off the battlefield, irrespective of title, perceived strength, or perceived intellect. In order to become a war boss of any stripe, an orc must be able to cement their dominance over an entire tribe of greenskins and then maintain it near continuously, lest their grip on power slip. They will always be the best equipped of their entire war when it comes to weapons and armour, either by beating up any orc daring to carry something flashier, or commissioning a mech boy to craft something extra special. This means that a war boss, already a hulking brute standing at least 50% taller than a human, will also often carry a ridiculously over the top and deadly gun, a melee weapon that only amplifies their prestigious strength and fighting skill, and probably wearing enough armour to make them a walking tank even before their likely brazen and gun laden transport is considered. Given they will also often surround themselves with knob bodyguards, each more than capable of becoming war boss one day, if a war boss is in 100 feet of you, let's say, you're probably already dead, or certainly you're about to be. Very few individuals can stand for long against a war boss in hand-to-hand -hand combat, let alone actually defeat one, and some bosses possess enough smarts to even command an army whilst getting stuck into the thickest of the fighting as well. These orcs, along with the mech boys beneath them, are a large part of what make orc wars so dangerous, but the canny or well-travelled amongst you may have spotted a flaw in the system. Despite their oft unfathomable resilience, orcs are not immortal, and this of course applies to war bosses too. As codified in Oshova's Book of the Beast and experienced by commanders the galaxy over, killing a war boss can be enough to collapse an entire war. This is because without the command of a war boss to keep everyone in line, orcs have a tendency to descend into anarchy, 
No one's in charge of giving the orders anymore, and infighting often breaks out. This is especially true actually among the knobs. There is no heir to the tribe per se, as the war bosses won't have intended on dying or wanted to elevate anyone above their rightful place. So the knobs will often fight among themselves to determine who will take over and subsequently restore a semblance of order to the others. This is actually quite manageable off the battlefield for the orcs. War bosses often have to fight challenges in fighting pits, so similar methods can be used as a form of election. But it takes time, and it costs lives that your enemies can exploit. And on the battlefield, already a frantic, chaotic place, especially with orcs around, there is no time to fight it out or deal with the issue. This is why the cut-off-the-head tactics used against the orcs are so effective, as even if it doesn't cause the war to implode, it can turn a key battle or buy a measure of breathing room for their adversaries. However, it is far from foolproof as a method, and it requires good strategy and a good follow-up to make it stick. If the orcs get time to recuperate and find a new leader, it was basically all for naught, even if some of the greenskin cohesion has been reduced overall. There are many famous orc war bosses, many of whom will have been powerful enough to earn the title of Warlord, essentially the leader of a war made from several tribes and with subservient war bosses under their command. Undoubtedly, the greatest of all warlords, at least in the modern era, is the goth warlord Gazkul Mag Uruk Thraka. We will not be recounting Gazkul's tale in full as part of this log, as I've done that in a previous one where I go into much more detail but rest assured that the self-proclaimed poverty of the war is as powerful as ever. In fact, following a shock decapitation in a battle with Ragnar Blackmane of the Space Wolves, who Gazkul wounded so badly that he required the Rubicon Primaris to live, the war boss is arguably larger and more dangerous than he's ever been following the attentions of Mad Doc Grotznik. His sheer presence and power attracts more and more orcs to his banner, even from light years away, and the failure of the Space Wolves to finally kill him, even if that seemed to be part of the plan, means that his great war still poses a major threat. Whilst all orcs with sense almost revere Gazkul, there are many war bosses who wish to emulate or at least be second best to the prophet of the war. Take, for example, war chief Grog Iron Teeth, who operated on the Eastern Fringe and had been drawn to the attention of the Ultramarines Astartes chapter at least at one point. One of the cannier orc war bosses in the region, Grog was drawn into battles with the Tau Empire after they came to the aid of their crude auxiliaries. Unfortunately for the orcs, the long-ranged and advanced firepower of the Tau proved to be a real headache, forcing Grog to adapt. And he did. It is unknown how many worlds or systems fell to Grog in these wars, but the war chief's last engagements would prove to be his highest rise and eventual downfall. Coming to lead the war of pain boss Toothjaw from Arkanasha, Grog set his sights on the chasseau that had all but conquered that planet, Oshova and his newly founded Farsight enclaves. The commander was drawn off from his assigned mission of battling the Imperium to deal with the Orcs, tailing them into a campaign on the Sept world of Atari Vo. This became known to the Orcs as the War of Dakar, and it was a disaster for the Tau. Grog had hired the services of legendary freebooter Captain Badrock, and Oshova's arrogance walked him and his elite cadres right into an ambush. The forces of the Enclaves were decimated by this pseudo Cao Yon, and the loot the Orcs were able to take from the Tau made them even more dangerous going forward. Though the Tau of Atari Vo were eventually victorious despite more greenskins flocking to the War Chief's banner, Grog had already set his next plans in motion and left long before. While some of his forces went to the relic world of Arthas Moloch, Grog and the rest of his war doubled back to attack the Farsight Enclaves themselves. The now under-defended enclaves were all but overrun by the time Oshova's forces came home, and even with this reinforcement, Grog likely had the wars won on land, sea, and even in the air across the four key worlds. In the end, however, he would be undone by the elements themselves, with a little nudge for each of them by Oshova. Tinekla, Salashe, Lubgral, and Violos were taken back in turn, with Grog meeting his end in personal combat with Oshova during the final stages of the Violos assault. 
In truth, this summary probably doesn't truly convey the threat of War Grog, as it nearly collapsed four fully established set worlds at once, and even outsmarted one of Commander Puertide's most renowned students. Had it taken the Enclaves in full and converted them to a new base of operations, one can only speculate with panic about the danger it would pose to the wider region and the Tau Empire as a whole. After all, the War of Dhaka became legendary for just how much loot and power the Orcs got from a single engagement on a single world. With a little patience and some clever mech boys, who knows what they could have done with four entire worlds, one of which was essentially just a giant series of Earthcast labs. Oshova certainly recognised the threat. It is believed that Grog's ashes are kept by the commander in an orb of sorts, inscribed with the names of every Tau world that the war chief had conquered and burned. Also bear in mind that all life on Vior Loss had to be practically scalped and scorched clean just to put the orcs down. If it wasn't clear already, Grog Iron Teeth was dangerous. Whilst cataloguing the deeds of even 1% of orc war bosses would take an age, there are a couple of tales I've never told, yet find very interesting and or terrifying. The first of those is that of war boss Tusker, also known as the Demon Killer, and perhaps the only war boss to ever achieve a form of immortality. Tusker's Space Hulk was attacked in the warp by the Demonic Incursion, something not that uncommon due to the lack of Geller fields and whatnot on Space Hulks and Orc ships. The war boss killed the invading demons after heavy fighting, but it is said that it was such a rush for Tusker to fight the Neverborn that he wanted more, as much as he could get, in fact. As a consequence, Wa Tusker was directed toward the Cadian Gate back when that was still standing pre Cicatrix Maledictum. After smashing a few worlds deemed incredibly inhospitable as a warm up, Tusker stunned the vastly underprepared Imperial High Command by ignoring Cadia entirely and gunning it straight into the Eye of Terror. His forces would go on a rampage across a number of demon worlds inside the Eye, battering renegades, heretics and demons alike, before landing on a planet made entirely of flesh, but seemingly empty. The enraged warboss shot the ground in pure frustration, and the world reacted to it. And soon, on orders from their warboss, the entire war was attacking the ground they walked on, just to see what would happen. What happened was the awakening of the planet's owner, a demon prince of corn, and its vast armies that were more than a match for the already battered orcs. Tusker battled the demon prince itself and lost horribly, but was able to impale the demon with his power claw before his own death. Normally the tale would end there, but it did not, for somehow the blood god's eyes had fallen onto the forces of the demon killer. So impressed was Korn that it resurrected the entire war on the planet with each new dawn, letting them fight and die over and over and over again for the blood god's amusement. Eventually, War Tusker was brought from the demon world, supposedly to the brass citadel itself. Korn's reward for their endless war lust was endless war against his elite generals, presumably as training for the demons or a way to weed out the weak ones. If Tusker is aware of his favour with Korn, I doubt he minds one bit. He got his wish, a war against the demons that can never end even when he loses and dies. If orcs have a concept of Valhalla or Nirvana or whatever the humans call it, then this is probably it. Finally, let me tell you the tale of Warboss Clawjaw, perhaps better known by his epithet, the Mighty Mangler of Bork. In a manner not entirely dissimilar to Gazkul, the Warlord was once just a regular orc, believed to be known as Cog. Whilst he didn't suffer the same life-threatening fate as the Prophet of the War, he did end up changing his path wildly after eating a mutated squig of some sort. After recovering from the coma caused by this meal, Cog became the largest orc in the tribe by a vast margin, to the point that when he showed back up in the tribe, no one quite believed it was him, until he battered them. The new Cog, calling himself Clawjaw, smashed up every orc who dared question him, and before long, the entire planet known to the Imperium as Bork Prime was united under him. 
Fortunately for Clawjaw, there were plenty of humans for his now united war to smash up in turn, and forces from a number of Astartes chapters alongside the Astra Militarum formed up to oppose him. Despite setbacks along the way, the Orcs were able to win the war in the end, using a titanic gun known as the Crater Maker to destroy the planetary capital of Furnace Hive. Bork Prime was now simply known as Bork, and it was the start of what became a mighty empire under the rule of Clawjaw. Other Imperial forces have set out to destroy the war boss, but the mighty Mangler lived up to his name over and over again. War Clawjaw became famous for its flotillas of heavily armoured transports, the Battle Wagon Brigades. They were all but unstoppable, and the Empire of Bork spread wide across the northeast corner of the galaxy. Post Valedictum, it's become impossible to track these things, especially since the Empire of Bork is as far into Imperium Nihilus as it's feasibly possible to go. But I don't doubt that the Mighty Mangler is still around even today. And there you have it, an insight into the Orc War Boss and their role in Greenskin society. As stated earlier, never underestimate one of these creatures in brains or brawn. They are mighty warriors with more than a bit of canniness on occasions, always carrying the flashiest kit to war with a near invincibility complex. Any Orc is dangerous under any circumstances, but the War Bosses and Warlords are perhaps most of all and they're certainly more than capable of ripping apart almost anything they fight from Imperial Guardsman to Imperial Knight. But for now, we must move on. Next time, I wish to take things in a more mechanical direction, as we've dealt with biology, society, and the Immaterium in recent logs. We'll be looking at not the greatest of war machines in the Imperium, but perhaps weapons even more powerful than that, unique leviathans of war able to devastate an entire city in a single hammer blow. That's for the future though. For now, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.